We are studying one of the masterpieces of history. We are studying the epistle to the Romans by the great apostle Paul. Controversy, it's loaded. Truth, it's paramount. You are certainly going to enjoy it, and I hope you won't miss a single lesson. The book of Romans is the sixth of the books, or the epistles, that Paul wrote uh, to the churches. It is the 45th book of the entire Bible, book number 45, beginning in Genesis. It's composed of 16 chapters. It has 433 verses. It has 87 questions and answers. And a lot of blessing. If you're ready for it, say amen. amen. Possibly before we delve deeply into the truths embodied in this remarkable book. Maybe the thing that amazes me most is this, that this gentleman met death by execution. I suppose he had a burial ceremony, I'm not sure, but he was decapitated by Nero, the emperor of Rome. And I can hear that Roman emperor scornfully say, because Paul was already writing letters from Rome saying, they of Caesar's household greet you. He had busted right into the royal family. I just imagine Caesar's mother-in-law got saved and was giving it to him every time to sit down to eat. And he said, you little indigestible Jew, today is the end of you, and tomorrow the world won't ever know that you were born. And 2,000 years later, we gather to study what he wrote. 2,000 years later, we don't know one word Nero ever said. But we name our sons Paul after this amazing hero of the faith. And if we find a stray dog in the alley, we name him Nero. <laughs> it's amazing how the world can change. It's amazing how prestige can change. It's better to shoot for the long haul. It's better to be hated now and loved after than to be tolerated now and hated after. Here was a great man. We ought to become familiar with him because 2,000 years of greatness is great. Not very pe many people can survive even their name. When we go into ancient history, we find so many people that, emperors and so forth, and, and great generals that put their name on certain pillars and say, here is so-and-so the great, and we can't even pronounce his name. And nobody knows he's ever born if they hadn't found that pillar about 40 foot down in the earth. But more people read the words of this man here than of any other person that's ever lived. The Apostle's writings. And so how beautiful it is. Look in the first chapter. Chapter 1 and verse 1. And it gives you an identity clause here. He said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. That Greek word there is not the word you think for servant where you hire somebody to do something but it is slave, slave. He addressed himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. He identifies him by saying Jesus Christ. He is not a slave to Judaic religion. I think he might have been one time. He's not a slave to the times in which he lived, very progressive times during the Roman Empire. Of, of dominating the whole world and building highways and securing the highways where men could travel. But his slavery was not to that. He says, I am a slave of a person whose name is Jesus Christ. 
What a tremendous identity he starts off with there. But he moves further into that. He says that this person, Jesus Christ, called, and that's the same in your Bibles, C-A-L-L-E-D, called to be an apostle. Now, 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 that was his calling. He was an expert teacher. He was so brilliant that even a governor and a king said he was a madman because of his knowledge. That he spoke so far beyond them. And so powerfully until they couldn't resist him. And, and they said, much learning hath made you mad. But he says, I am called to be an apostle. You, you, you may be called to be a carpenter. You may be called to be an electronic uh, person. But here's a man who said, I am called to be an apostle. Called of God. Chosen of God. His chief thing in life was apostleship. You say, what is an apostle? It means a called out one, an apostle is. But in the New Testament, an apostle is a person who embodies the total five ministries. He is a prophet. He is a pastor. He is an evangelist. He is a teacher. An apostle is the chief one, not, not in prestige. That's not found in the New Testament. But in ministry, a person that can go to a foreign field, start at zero, build a church, teach the principles of Christ, baptize them in water, start a Bible school in his church, prophesy to those people that he is identified as an apostle. But apostleship is not something you wear as a tag, because tags can be obnoxious. How would you feel if you saw me walk around with a big tag on my, saying, Apostle? Inside of you, your bowels would just growl a little and say, come on, I take it a little easy here. But apostleship is like a tree, an apple tree. An apple tree doesn't have to wear a tag at all. It produces apples. So in these five ministers here, you don't have to call yourself an evangelist. And there are people who call themselves evangelists that don't get many people saved. An evangelist is an evangelizer and brings good news to multitudes of people. And they become converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. You see, he doesn't have to wear a tag for it. The same is true of a pastor. There are men that are over churches that God knows they're not pastors. They don't have a pastor's heart. They may be a preacher, but they're not a pastor. A pastor's heart says, let me heal the sheep. Let me love the sheep. Let me go out and bring in the sheep. Let me guide the sheep. So you don't have to wear a tag as being a pastor. We can look and see if the sheep are well and not beaten down and not fleeced to where they see their skinny ribs. But they're well and they're happy. Then you say, well, he's a pastor, but an apostle has all of these abilities, and this man had them. So he was a, a slave of Jesus Christ. He had been called to be an apostle. He didn't just choose it, you know. The Lord Jesus says, you will be an apostle of mine, which embodies all the five ministers and not just one of them. And then look at the third thing. Separated under the gospel of Christ. I get really touched at times when I, when I see a pastor and he sells insurance on the side, sells automobiles on the side, sells real estate on the side, and, and, and does all kinds of interesting things, but he's not totally separated under the gospel of God. Now, you're looking at a strange one right now. I would preach if I was hungry. I would preach if I was naked. I would preach if nobody gave me anything for preaching because I've been called to be a preacher. And you say, but how are you going to live? Now you see, that shows you don't have faith. You know what I tell a young man? If you want to be a success, if you want to build a church, 
First thing, you're not lazy. You know when to get up. Every rooster knows when to get up. If you're going to be God's rooster, get up. Start crowing. Then by 8 o'clock, you start going house to house. And just say, good morning, says, I'm a servant of the Lord. The Lord's asked me to see if you have a problem here, some kind I could pray for. Anybody sick? Anybody need help? That you just go house to house and do that. By noon, somebody's going to give you lunch. You may have two lunches by noon. Then if you won't be lazy, we'll go back out at 1 o'clock and start over again. House to house. Can I bless you? Can I help you, please? By evening, somebody's going to say, hey, eat dinner with us. And would you like to sleep here with us? And if you do that for about five days, they're going to be following you through the street saying, where are we going to meet on Sunday? You've already got a church. Belly aching never did anything. And saying God is not good puts God in the wrong light. But if you will work, you will receive wages for your work. God will see that you get it. He said he was separated under the gospel of God. Separated unto it. He left off everything else and became a separated man. And your point number one there, it tells us that here's a man who wrote under a strange inspiration called the Holy Spirit. That his writing was not, oh, I'm, I, I'm sure his brilliance had to get into it some way or another. You, you, you can't have a sharp mind and not use it. But here was a man who, what he wrote, believed that it came up out of his spirit, not out of his mind. And that he wrote under the divine inspiration from heaven. That's quite an achievement. When this book was first written in China, they told me when I was in China this. When this book was first written in Chinese, the book of Romans, there's some Chinese scholars got a hold of it and came and said, now, now, why did you put the word Romans on here? They said it was written to the people in Rome. They said, no, we don't believe that. He said, you, you white men, you have come here and you have seen all of our mistakes that we make and all of our weaknesses that we have. And you've written a book, and in order for us not to know that you're talking straight to us, you put Romans on it. But says, now you know this is a book to the Chinese. Everything in there belongs to the Chinese. Well, that's true, it does. And the Japanese and the Russians and the Africans and the Europeans, it belongs to every human being on the face of the earth. This is not a book with a local flavor. It's a book to humanity. It's a book to the man, to the woman, that they can understand the ways of God with a man who wasn't afraid to tell it, just like it is. Paul wrote this book, it's so interesting to me, about 58 years A.D., in the beginning of this, uh, this whole uh, double millennium that we've been working on from the time of Christ until now. This was 25 or 30 years after Jesus Christ had returned back to heaven that he wrote this book. So he'd been on the way now quite a while. He was in the city of Corinth. I have been to Corinth. They, they still have a lot of the remains right from Paul's day uh, until today. They still have it today. And it's very interesting. You see the, 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 old, the old city of Corinth. But it was in this city, <laughs> a city full of sin, a city full of immorality, a city, a, a, a city uh, full of uh, all kind of superstitions and and, and all kind of idolatries. And from that book, from that area, from that city, he wrote this titanic epistle. You know, your geographical area that you might be in doesn't keep you from being great. I've often told people, and nobody hardly wants to believe it, but the biggest thing about Jesus is that he stayed in Nazareth for 30 years. And every day the devil hounded him and said, now you know nothing good ever came out of Nazareth. And everybody knows it. And they talk about it everywhere. You know, this is the scrubbiest little town. And by the way, it still is. 
We have more problems in Nazareth than we have anywhere else in the, in the Holy Land. With the citizens there, we have problems. With the, shop, with the shopkeepers, we have problems. They're still the same kind of bunch that lived there in Jesus' day. They hadn't grown up yet. And the devil will keep saying, how do you ever expect to be great staying around the worst town in the whole country? And he said, for the same reason that God brings lilies out of the mire. Then the devil said, but you're staying here too long. Why don't you gravitate to Jerusalem where things happen? He says, Jerusalem will see me on divine schedule. I just want to tell young minister something. The devil can't hide you. And you can be in a small town and make a big, a big noise. And you can be in an out-of-the-way place. And God can bring you to the front. God is not limited. But I assure you one thing. During those 30 years in Nazareth, Jesus built the finest tables that city ever saw. And made the most beautiful dress of drawers anybody had. And everybody was glad they said, we own a cheap piece of Jesus' furniture. So he did what he was supposed to do. And at that hour of going out, he went out in a burst of glory and saved the world. So, so you're not limited. God takes care of every limitation. If you know it, say amen. amen. Paul addressed this mighty document to the church. Now, now if you read Acts chapter 2, you will discover that people were from Rome the day the church was born. So now the church in itself had already been there, you see, uh, over 50 years. It had already been there. This was in 58 AD. And so here we find the church wasn't a baby there in Rome. It was a church that was founded on the day of Pentecost along with the other areas of the world because visitors from Rome were present the very moment the church was born, and they returned to tell the story. You find that in Acts chapter 2, verse 10. It gives you the names of the countries that were there and received the Holy Ghost that day. From Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, uh, Cyrene, and strangers of Rome. And so the Romans were there, received it. So the church in Rome now had two groups of people, Jews and proselytes, they call them. That means people who have been converted. And so they were Jews who had turned from Judaism to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were what we call Gentiles, who's everybody else other than Jews. And it was made up of, of the two kinds of people. So when he's addressing, he's not just speaking to Jewish people, nor just to Gentile people. He's talking to everybody. That city of Rome was the capital of the world at that time, and he was taking a punch at the whole world. And, and I guess you could change the name of that book to, not to the church in Rome, but the church of the world. Because he was shooting at the whole world. He wasn't trying to rectify Jewish problems, nor Gentile problems. They were human problems. They were our problems, the problems that we have today. And he was shooting for the whole thing. This great book that we're gonna study and penetrate and get answers from moves right into the innermost being of a human person. I mean, it uncovers. I had one of our men here today that I was speaking to this, this very day say, the things in Romans that I want to know about. And I said, all right, if I don't make them clear in the lesson, then you write questions on it. We'll answer them in the, in, in the follow-up because we have a right to know what God has to teach us what God wants to inform us. We have a right to know all the truths, the total truths. If we're living in the, in, the, in, the, in the final generation of the Gentile period, we ought to know the finality of all things. Can you say amen? amen? And our battle at this moment is with the finality of all things, whether it is science or government or morals or religion or whatnot. So he moves into the innermost being. He blesses the believer. He brings with it a full education in spiritual matters. A book loaded with theology. A book loaded with life. Yet a book that's tender. And you can find love in this book. 
is it is a truth regarding the righteousness of God, which is maybe the biggest thing we can say about it, to help us all to know how to live, of the righteousness of God. There are verses in there that just burn to the sky. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. <laughs> Righteousness, peace, and joy. You got the whole gospel in one verse. In one verse, the whole total gospel wrapped up in it. And we'll be, we'll be reaching to that. Now, this is Paul's first letter to Rome. It was delivered by a messenger named Phoebe. I thought that was very interesting, that he needed a lady to deliver it. You say, why did he use a lady? Weren't any men there? Why did Mary, Mary Magdalene have to be the first preacher of the resurrection? because all the men were hidden behind doors with the doors locked. You can't deliver much if you're behind doors with the doors locked. And every time we see a lady stand out into tremendous prominence, it might be just because a man refused to get out there and do anything. If the men would settle the problems of the world, I think the ladies could solve the problems of the home, then we'd have a happy world to live in. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, it says, I commend you unto Phoebe, our sister. This was a document that crossed the seas from the Grecian Empire over to the Roman Empire. And, and uh, he had her to carry this document, precious document, one original. Had she lost it, you'd have never heard of the book of Romans. I'm really glad she delivered it. <laughs> yes, sir. She is a servant of the church. Isn't that something? From the town of Centria. So here was a very beautiful and outstanding person. We get to heaven, we're going to meet a lot of nice people, aren't we? You know, this has been a great moment with us here with so many visitors. And, and uh, I've had so many to say, my, I met so-and-so. It was so happy. I'd heard about so-and-so for so long, and now I met them. It's been a, a week of getting to know each other. That's a little bit of heaven. Because when we get to heaven, we're going to really get to know a lot of good people. We're going to get to know a lot of people that didn't get the name in the book. But they got the name in God's book. And that's the reason they're in heaven. My, I'm looking forward to going to heaven. I am too. I've seen about everything on the earth. I'd just like to explore some more, get on out there a little further and see some, some beautiful things. Your point number two on, on page seven says, the book of Romans. Positively, for sure, we could call it the ABC of the New Testament truth and theology. That if you want a person to know very quickly and very sharply what God demands of them and what God wants us to do, just say, hey, come on, read the book of Romans. In the Old Testament, we could read the book of Proverbs. My, my grandson was with me recently, and I, I said, now, what I want you to do is to read the book of Proverbs. It took him a long time to get through chapter 1. And he had so many questions to ask about it. For example, he said, what does the fear of God mean? Am I supposed to be scared of God? And I said, no, that word fear there is respect. God wants us to respect him. And if you don't respect God, you can't go to heaven. You have to respect God. But in that Old Testament, and I want to say to all of us here, we ought to read a couple of chapters in the book of Proverbs every day. It really tells you how to live. It tells you the pitfalls that didn't just get here. They've been around for 3,000 years. Most of the holes you found in are old holes. People fell into them years ago. Why don't you stay out of them? They got little signs there. Don't park here. But we don't seem to listen very well. But in this book, we find the ABC. It proclaims the truth of salvation. It teaches the, the law of God. It demonstrates the grace of God. It explains a family of God and the Jews as God's people and the Gentiles grafted into the body of Christ and become an integral part of the glorious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in Romans 1 and 1, Paul makes it very clear who he was, what he was, and what he was dedicated to do. And so how glad we are that along with Paul, we can say we too are a bond slave 
of the Lord Jesus Christ.